to welcome everyone to this reading with Jenny Ryder and Stephen Riel. Uh, my name is Greg Newton. My partner is Donnie Jokum, and we are the co-founders of the Bureau of General Services Queer Vision, which is the space you now find yourself in. Uh, the Bureau is a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. <laughs> and the service we provide is holding this space for queer books and queer culture. And we started this project in 2012. We've been here at the LGBT Community Center since 2014. And we're still going strong in spite of everything. <laughs> Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, we're really happy to welcome Jendi back and to welcome Stephen for the first time. Sure. And uh, we are an all-volunteer organization. We do have a suggested donation of $10, and there's some change in the bag. I'll pass that around. We can also take credit card donations at the register. Many of you gave online, which we appreciate, so you're good to go. Um, and if money is tight and you want to buy some books, please hold on to your money to buy. <laughs> we, we like that. Um, so I'll pass that around. Can you say hello to the seven folks who are dotted in the end? Hello, seven folks who are dotted <laughs> <in. laughs> Sorry, it's well, after all this time, you think I'd be used to the TV audience thing, but it's still not quite there. Um, so let me pass this around. Um, and one last thing I'll say before uh, reading Jendi's bio is uh, we have an email list. If you like, what's that? Oh yes, <laughs> turning off your cell phones. If you wouldn't mind turning off your ringers so we're not interrupted. And um, if you're not already on our email list and you would like to be, you can sign up for that at the register and you'll get an email every other Monday about our upcoming events. And we have quite a packed calendar for April, May, and June. And July, we will last. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me introduce Jendi, our first reader, and we're gonna jump right in. So Jendi Ryder is the author of the novel Two Natures from Saddle Road Press 2016, the short story collection and incomplete list of my wishes from Sunshot Press 2018, and four poetry books and chapbooks, most recently Bullies in Love from Little Red Tree 2015. Their awards include a Massachusetts Cultural Council Fellowship for Poetry, the New Letters Prize for Fiction, the WAGS Review Poetry Prize, the Bayou Magazine Editor's Prize in Fiction, and two awards from the Poetry Society of America. Two Natures won the Rainbow Award for Best Gay Contemporary Fiction and was a finalist for the Book Excellence Awards and the Lasco Prize for Fiction. They are the editor of winningwriters.com, an online resource site with contests and markets for creative writers. Please welcome Jen D. Wright. Thank you, everybody. It's such a spiritually healing experience to be back in this temple of queer art and to be part of this community of queer writers and artists. Thank you so much for coming. This is my new collection, Made Man, which is about my gender transition and many other things. And it's a pleasure to read from it today. There's a bunch of poems in this book, which are self-portraits as different objects or as fictional characters. And when I was conceiving of this collection, I decided that I didn't just want to limit myself to role models as actual men or male adjacent people, but actually exploring gender in a sort of a slant way through uh, the stories that we construct and the lives of objects and the lives of, of characters that are in some way considered other than human or less than human or constructed because that's so often what I feel we have to do as, as queer people is to, to cobble something together in this patchwork collage sort of way, uh, which can be beautiful and also a lot of work. So this first poem is called Self-Portrait as Pastry Box. <laughs> <laughs> Under my roof, Cathedrals of piped icing breathe out the sacred stale sweetness of cream and cardboard. 
white as a right-hand man's final satin bed. Under my roof, we pay our respects. The family is a thin shelter, soon wet. If you don't believe me, open and see the red smash where tiered berries kiss the jostle lid. No shifting the ingredients, no loose knots in the string. Under my roof, I'll thank you not to take knives in vain. Remember him who was lifted from the river, from the box he was sealed in. The snapped wafer laid on your tongue like a secret recipe. Religion's root means to tie string round the wrists, the trash bag sinking, the harbor surface restored. Under my roof, the family's bound to gasp, glorying in the sugar name I display to be sliced after the blown out wish. Take the cannoli broken for you. <laughs> So back when I, people thought that I was a girl, um, I don't know if you remember in the 1980s, Laura Ashley, it was like this <laughs> fabric that was like for women's dresses and curtains. So uh, I had to wear a lot of that. <laughs> it was very traumatic. <laughs> so this poem is called, I'm a Laura Ashley man myself. <laughs> Mother desired a sofa, but instead she had me. <laughs> <laughs> Electrified needles, pimpling horsehair cheeks, girl tender. Ruffle and sham matched rosebuds marching down our flannel gowns. My prickled legs fizzled static. When I watched Tootsie, I was sick in lonely school day bed. Tear stung comedy of red lame, my dowdy fate, to teeter knock need toward mistaken love. Mother withheld lipstick and lingerie. I didn't fight being stone bellied Venus in pinafores, lace collar sow, as bottom to Titania, disguise only one character believed. This dead end hybrid I would be mule bearing secret stallion script. Mother coveted silks and porcelain breeding in a rusted 12th floor bath where eyelid white plastic cut like lace curtained her razor prettying my thighs. And so ribboned I raced blinded away. Because why write poetry if you can't embarrass your parents, right? <laughs> no offense to any family who are here right now. You're all great. We love you. <laughs> Bye, book. <laughs> so so uh, on, on Twitter, the acronym All Cops Are Bastard, ACAB, was making the rounds um, during the, the George Floyd protests. and. And there's also a, a story about a gender reveal party. I, I don't know if you know what gender reveal parties are, but if you haven't uh, uh, seen this abomination before, it's like <laughs> people uh, set off like fireworks or pink and blue bombs or whatever, and like glitter bombs, and, like to announce what gender they, their child is going to be from an ultrasound, assuming they actually know that uh, based on you know whether they see. <laughs> on the ultrasound or not. Um, so there was a wildfire that was set off by a gender reveal party. Um, I don't know what year that was. <laughs> in California, 20 years, in 2021, there was a wildfire and someone set off like some, you know, fireworks or something and it burned a lot. So, so I wrote this, uh, this poem called All Cakes Are Bastards. <laughs> So to, to put that in context, they do these cakes for gender reveal parties and have these really heteronormative weird slogans on them. So, so that's why all cakes are bastards. <laughs> in the late summer of a state on fire, they prepared for my birth with buttercream, guns or glitter. 
in the streets where kneeling on necks, the blue horsemen snuffed another dark breath. They drove masked to the mall for plastic feet to spear into frosting. In the dry wind, they dreamed of lures or lace, my two choices under an orange sky as I slumbered normal in the blood rich sea, as ash fell on the green courses. As I grew into my ultrasound assignment, they directed the baker's hand, putters or pearls, rifles or ruffles, the sugared script radiating pink and blue, Los Angeles sunsets round the clock now. In the summer, the kindling lay in wait for the revelation of bullets or ballet. <laughs> they set out the knives on a blanket in El Dorado State Ranch Park and the white cruiser of the sheet cake did say, buck or dough, cut to know. <laughs> cut to explosive footage of a color not reported with the 10,000 acres burned. And they walked out of there alive, a color the pyrotechnic choice of badges or bows, badges or burial. And the news would not expose their names as I was exposed. The ultrasound technician's pen circling flesh or its absence. My gender is fire. Ooh. 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 No, well, you know, my gender is fire. It's when I'm always hot. It's when I'm always hot. So, uh, maybe last year, I think. I, as you could tell from the Laura Ashley poem, I was kind of raised in a cult of one. Um, my mother thought that she lived in Victorian era. So we didn't actually watch a lot of movies. So the first time I got to see Jurassic Park was actually last year. And I was just blown away by how much transmasculine resonance um, Jeff Goldblum's character had. <laughs> just always lying around without his shirt talking about feminism. I mean, this is so post-op surgery. <laughs> So I wrote this poem, which is, uh, if you know the movie, has a lot of remixed quotations from Jurassic Park. And it's called Lesbian Dinosaur Island. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise known as Northampton. <laughs> I love New Northampton. <laughs> oh, lesbian, yay. <laughs> Lesbian Dinosaur Island. Entirely female, they can't breed. The great white grandpa hunter assures the money man. We simply deny them that. Chromosomes are not really that difficult. We give them cows, an electroshock. No unauthorized self-discovery. Hold on to your eggs. What do you call a transsexual? Dylan or Austin or Malcolm or Ian? Now I'm talking to myself, chaos soft boy. That's an unauthorized future. We simply deny them that. It's safe here without an extra hormone. You can look up their skirts on the tour. You wanna see a discovery? I'll take my shirt off. You wanna see a rape? Nobody could have predicted that. All vertebrates inherently female, they can't do it because they shouldn't. And we hope you'll endorse this completely safe experience for your children. We simply deny them that boat leaving in 11 minutes at the right developmental stage. Mm -hmm. Take a chance and move me, top scarred explorer. Strange attraction can't be contained. Dinosaur creates man. I'm simply saying, run faster, clever girl. Life finds a way. Oh, and I'd like to pause to show you the amazing artwork by my friend, Tom Taylor, otherwise known as the Poet Spiel. This is the, the cover. And there's also artwork inside the book, which you can't really see it from here, but when you buy the book, you will get to see it. He's really great and a wonderful 80 year old gay man out in the Southwest who is totally gonzo and we love him. And I'm really excited that his artwork is in my book. So it's called Rags and Chains. Mm -hmm. 
Rags and chains. I'm trying to face the audience and the camera. I'm not sure I can do that. What beauty divides ruins from garbage? Disuse a track long enough, it becomes a sad song, not the frustrated end of a journey people found other ways to take. They didn't think they would, but they already had. Swap click clack for vroom, cut stone for port slurry. I'm not a man, but I've thrown out a hundred dresses. Tried not to spit mud on cotton rosebuds. Pictured the ghost of me in tiny shoes, still loving this lace. Barry Manilow in my earbuds croons even now, like no one's told him, certain words are done. Some rhymes too simple to carry us down the road we once again delay. Alongside this rail trail, the brick back of a factory turned art lofts, cracked eggshells of car hoods, a heap high as a pitcher's mound of rusted chains with oil stained rags wrapped round. I'm not a man, but I want to be as happy as a post surgical selfie on Twitter. Beautiful, beautiful music. They look in the mirror and say, There you are. Rags and chains, a slaughterhouse of intestines, pile of strength and the end of function unexplained. When does the empty town become quaint with ghosts? Some warm breathing things never go beyond waste. Wet organs sealed in bags, still white washer dryers opening their black O mouths under the landfill. I'm not a man, but every spring cleaning, I stand in the crushed pink pumps of bittersweet 16, feel like falling over, put them back, and my heart is calling, oh Mandy. <laughs> I did finally give those shoes away, <laughs> but it was not easy. Okay, this poem this is a prose poem also. It's called Titanic Heart. And uh, there's another one written for revenge on somebody who took my, my jewelry. <laughs> but I bought myself another one. Titanic Heart. A gay Orthodox boy in Australia is wearing my grandmother's diamonds under his everyday white shirts buttoned to the neck against his skin like the fringes whisper of God. He is the fifth of 12 children, the third son, and so statistically likely to take too much pleasure in the gabardine funk of the minion, shoulder to shoulder muttering baritone prayers through soft curling beards. When he needs it most, he touches the hard hidden facets where his thin collarbones meet. As many times a day as he fingers his new mustache, scruffy as outback grass. It's his mezuzah, his counter commandment that he writes on no doorposts and teaches no children. My grandmother's diamond heart has a hole, its own shape in the middle. Sadness runs in my family like a vein. The gay Orthodox boy doesn't know that his father, a rabbi in America, who speaks with a shtetl accent, though he grew up in secular Illinois, was given the necklace by my mad mother who stole it from me. In my heart is a mine, black coal, pitiless exchange. The gay Orthodox boy's mother knows a family in Australia whose daughter has been arranged to marry him when he turns 18. He must give her my grandmother's diamonds in 11 months and two days. My, grandma, my grandfather died one afternoon in the street, his heart defect unknown till then, strained by lifting trays of catered dishes. My grandmother broke apart like a wine glass under a groom's heel, like their daughter's mind then and again later. My mother raged that she couldn't keep me like the secret lover the gay Orthodox boy has never had, the warm breathing twin he pretends gifted him this antique uncomfortable chain around his neck. At the end of Titanic, when old Rose tosses the priceless necklace into the sea, we're meant to agree that a gesture to the dead is worth making the living's quest futile. The gay Orthodox boy has read every commentary. He doesn't know what flesh comforted the writers of Leviticus, any more than I know who gave my grandmother the diamonds she entrusted my mother to hold for me for when I became what they expected, a woman. 
By the time I was six, both my mother's parents were dead. And now the necklace is gone. And the gay Orthodox boy does not exist. I only imagined him, so my heart would soften around the sharp jewel of spoiled memory. But the leaf could be the chain on which the world dangles, the unseen gem that flames white in the arc's velvet void. And now for something completely different. <laughs> This poem was inspired by a couple of people in the audience. You know who you are. <laughs> John <and> Jim. <laughs> Should I send you a picture of my butthole? <laughs> <laughs> my friend's art opening is dubbed The Hole in New York. I couldn't make it to diva dance in the tented canvas womb, studded with unnamed photos of bent over fleshy lip portals. <laughs> my friend and his husband invited me to send pictures of my body's holes or writing pulled out of them. The only person for whom this is not a joke is my friend who has visions of sacred colors when his root chakra shivers at the entry of a guest. My friend was a Christian linebacker and now is naked at every opportunity, expelling shame like a placenta. I don't feel my butthole is really about me. If photographed, it would not reflect my freedom or humiliation. When I spilled my honeymoon blood, I didn't grow up. I had more laundry. My friend's husband would have taken me for his photo series, all in the open, tits, midriff rolls, and packer, how I wanted to see myself. But I was once diagnosed as a narcissist for asking for snacks during the Rorschach test. <laughs> My friend's husband couldn't guarantee where my butthole would travel in the cloud of data that embodies us. Every transaction now a portal I have to protect as a mother, but I could be overreacting. Nobody in New York has time for your butthole except the cops. <laughs> my friend is a gay man and I'm a woman. So it takes me too long to come to the realization when he faced the question of me about the creative energy in his man pussy, signing off, let your meat flop, that it could theoretically fuck if I weren't monogamous and really unwilling to substitute pleasure for friendship. Is this is what it's like being a guy? You can never escape your own butthole. <laughs> I think I see you in embarrassing and embarrassing <laughs> I get a prize. Do I have time for one more? Yeah. Okay. All right. Do we want do we want a semi-serious long poem or do you want a poem about a penis? <laughs> Whatever you want. Okay. I'm gonna do starting a serious long poem because I think that was more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> Hello out there on YouTube last. Something about flipping a coin, heads or <laughs> no, I, I think I'm going to go with the semi-serious one. Hey, this, uh, to understand as much as you can ever understand anything I say, this poem, read the note in this poem. So a golem in Jewish folklore is a human figure made of clay that is brought to life by magic, usually protect the Jewish people from persecution. And the most famous such legend is the golem of Prague, allegedly created by Rabbi Lou in the 16th century. The rabbi wrote the word truth Emmet, on its forehead to bring it to life. However, when it went on a rampage, he had to deactivate it by changing the inscription to death met. So that's, that's the context for this poem, Vilna is Burning, dedicated to Billy Porter and Indian Moore. Truth waits till sundown to come out of the A train stop on 155th. He remembers Sabbath observing hands, stripping the paper name from his forehead. He remembers his clay sleep in an overseas crate marked for a Hester Street tailor shop. 71 winters measured in chalk and shears, sons of sons pinning broad, then narrow, then broad lapels to Truth's nerveless shoulders. Truth found the scroll that would wake him to labor almost at once, but time never seemed right in the new world to raise his giant head in the workers' hungry crowd. How dare he compete with the fathers, budget slave who neither eats nor speaks. But when the last son rolled off his cloth tape, 
Truth came to himself on a trash truck uptown, still in the sharp purple blazer and parachute pants of his final window display. Thus he strutted into the televised streets. In a record shop's plate glass, his face reflected four centuries baked brown. A sign read, soul, so he entered, perhaps to barter heavy lifting for the one thing he lacked. She waiting on him. She was the first angel to match his height. Black hair glossy as a spinning 45, bronze legs that went on and on like Friday night prayer. Tonight, extravaganza. DJ and Paisley top hat preaches pose, though truth can see the letter some clergyman erased to write death on his forehead too. While truth's retail angel vogues for the honor of the house she mothers in a gown he sewed, silvery chiffon lofting like the smoke of torched Prague. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jandy. Okay. Stephen Riel is the author of two full length collections of poetry, Fellow Odd Fellow from Trio House Press in 2014, and Edgemere from Lily Poetry Review Books 2021. His most recent chapbook, Postcard from P Town, was published as runner up for the inaugural Robin Becker Chapbook Prize. His poems have appeared in several anthologies and numerous periodicals, including the Minnesota Review and the International Poetry Review. He currently serves as editor-in-chief of the Franco-American literary e-journal, Raisonnance. Please welcome Stephen Ria. Thanks so much to Jendi for uh, inviting me to this evening and making this happen. It's really interesting to think about how our, our journeys and our work are, can be in conversation. Um, and I too want to just remark on the incredible space to have this reading in. I'm so inspired to be surrounded by these books and this artwork and I feel this place when I walked in the door. So thank you. It's really fun to have my mask off. <laughs> uh, the first poem I'm going to read is called Sand Pile with Sissy. I was not drawn to haul dirt in a Tonka truck nor grade the damp sand of lanes planned to wind through quaint suburban developments, nor bugle with spitty lower lips the exhales of downshifting. My pals battled over claw loaders with the vanquished carting culverts on flatbed trucks cross town. I never had to tussle because no other nearby boy coveted the chariot I lusted for, a vermilion station wagon, its glossy enamel brash as nail polish. My make-believe errands proved the utility of byways laid out by the boyish boys and their dirty hands, though under my breath I touched Tut about construction delays, <laughs> the dust they would deposit on my dashboard. I take unnecessary detours I called caprices, the long way back from the butchers, to feel the breeze flatten my chiffon scarf, while I dreamed that I drove an aerodynamic convertible and its forward look. Suddenly, it's 1960, rocket ahead in glamorous style, or the Lincoln Landau that full page ads I scrutinized on our coffee table showed accompanied by a cocktail dress, a rich bow to swing open the passenger door, 
like a well-trained dog. Joey and John shook hands on laying a railway spur through their sand and gravel. While I pictured the big plaid, big threads of my car coat's elbow length sleeves, its implausible collar, and reveled in my soap opera worries. Would the bold red of this wagon in its carport clash with the cedar stained stakes of our ranch? Would the watermelon carved into a baby buggy I discovered in one of my mother's cookbooks and oh, so ache to fill with grapes and lemon bites, earn me ooze at my best friend's shower? When my salt and pepper Rock Hudson husband returned from the city to find the workmen gone, our neighborhood completed, and me with fresh lipstick puckered for a kiss, would he be pleased or open his eyes one dawn and see me as a maraschino fossil buried in last week's jello mold? It's been very interesting to be a pro-feminist man and to try to write about and through my effeminacy. Sometimes it's a dangerous thing to try. <laughs> and I, I, I'm aware of that, fortunately and unfortunately, right? This takes on another set of uh, possible pitfalls. This is called Lena Horn. Eventually, I wanted to start writing in the voices of, of women and exploring uh, myself in, in part through that. So this poem has three parts. Lena Horn. One, she watches herself, 1960. I knocked back two martinis before flipping on the set to catch myself. These are the openings I've smoldered for. Now that I've wedged my Vivier toe back inside the soundstage door, the drop dead half of a duet with Frank, Dixieland's shears can't snip me out. Today's houses have antennas. MGM kept me out of the story so the plot would splice nice if I were gone. I have cause to dwell on it. Sure, I would have stuck in Tuscaloosa's craw. My grandmother Horn was the bastard of a gray-eyed Calhoun. I'm not girl enough to think my curvaceous strut on tonight's ABC will save the balls of my brothers back into some mud rutted hollow, but it's being broadcast from Newark to Yalabusha, and I'm digging my hope diamond grin cause I'm about to let him have it with just how smooth this negress in a thousand dollar spangle can swing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I watch you 2005. Clicking past public TV, I arrow back till I marvel face to face with who's she? At first, I see only the sparkle of fitted obsidian gown, mermaid at midnight. Then you open your piano wide mouth into yawning indifference, curl a lip around a lament, scorch an X with a blaze in the onyx of your eyes. The only humans I've encountered this a quiver with drama are drag queens who glue themselves together, follicle by mannerism, by phrase. They strive to disappear as they reveal a diva. 
My stare is stuck to every quirky nod and glare as you mix sadness and seduction like gasoline and fire, cooing, coaxing. Don't you want to forget someone too? While well, Sinatra, overdue for a vacation, goes through the motions, abstractedly snapping his fingers next to a live one. Three, song stylist. Days later, biographies fanned like feathers on my bed. I'm puzzling out your sorrows, trying on their contours. They say people pay to see you, not to hear you sing. But your half of this duet I gawked at aired eons after your debut as jailbait at the Cotton Club. By the 60s, you'd been blacklisted, breathed freedom in France, left off leaning against pedestals, crooning in a vacant vibrato to no one in particular. Tutored by your new husband, now each word came flavored, drenched in style. Was this success or a thick after dinner drink for those smoky clubs in Vegas? In my mirror, I'm overlaying the outlines, asking me, asking you, asking me, who sang instead of us? What were we expecting? Revolution? Was it too late? Had the damage been done? Did just another act upstage the song? So my poor younger brother, David, died of AIDS when he was 28 years old. I, sorry, it's hard to say that in New York City. Um, so many people died here. Um, this poem has uh, four parts. It's called, Abel has no, almost no immune system. One. The red footnote on the label of the miracle drug catches my eye. Abel's in the 33% who vomit up nearly every bite. Mom and dad told me he sobbed on the long distance call before a catheter was tunneled between his clavicle and first rib so he could feed through his subclavian. Other clinical words collide, collide into Eden after pancreatitis, toxoplasmosis, after Abel's insurance company couldn't drop kick him fast enough. His lover works late hours to cover their mortgage. Wouldn't you? I borrow shekels to board the shuttle to their condo. Abel lies upstairs starving, just levering his bony 99 pounds into the bathtub hurts us both. After another 24 hours, when anyone less gone would have moaned, I'm hungry, the feeding machine arrives. Aqua plastic box, like a vacuum cleaner, gleaming steel caddy, plastic tubes, plastic bags of almost fluorescent white nourishment. Welcome to the family. A nurse swings by to run through instructions as intricate as life. One, interlocking joints. Two, kept sterile with alcohol wipes. Three, spill into Abel's core. Oh, that feels cool he murmurs. This mission is a booby trap when each step must be followed to the iota to foil microbes. Is it possible to be precisely prophylactic forever and ever? 
And what if someone sleepy and or absent-minded stumbles through what's now second shift? How to gauge a turn for the worse? I am my brother's keeper. Two. Yes, my name is Cain, and I'm calling about Abel. Yes, I do have his patient ID. I want to see the bill the home health company submitted, the 3D pie charts accounting blazoned at board meetings to extol how much moolah was pinched by discharging failing policyholders into the land of Nod. For the criminal trial, our lawyers subpoena this quarter's financials, issue interrogatories to establish bloated profits the LLC diversified, how many day spas it spawned east of Eden, how many golf courses begat among thistle and thorn. Three, all evidence will be offered to Adonai. Four, I am the wobbly tiller in Abel's room who paces but must, must keep steady. With rigid fingers, I hold the survival of my first rival whose birth introduced me to the murderous scythe I swing inside. This vigil will last days, only hours, in fact, unto dust that shall return. His sleek alarm clock sweeps silently on while I scribble lists of specialists, lay siege to another helpline's moat. Abel has no drawbridge, one or two white cells left to rouse. One slip, one contaminated swipe. If only I could kneel beside his bed and believe. Well, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of um, Frank O'Hara's poetry and, and the, 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 the wonderful line, Lana Turner is dead. So of course I had to riff on that a few times. So in this book, there's uh, Kitty Carlisle is dead. And then this is Robert Goulet is dead. Um, I say, when I read this in Franco-American circles, I always say that I didn't set out to write a Franco-American gay poem. It came to me. <laughs> uh, this, you know, part of, for me, part of my relationship with gayness and my effeminacy is I don't know how I became so campy. I just am. It just comes through me. I have to get out of the way. <laughs> and in this poem, the speaker took over. I really, I feel embarrassed by this, this, this speaker, but it's okay, right? <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, um, there's a little French in here. And I think the only thing that you won't, recognizes uh, Tigar is like a, a nickname for little guy, okay? So Robert Goulet grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts, Lawrence, sorry, um, and was a Franco-American like me. Robert Goulet is dead. With your demise, one sure fire aphrodisiac flickers, but never goes out. Five years old, hips jammed against the fabric front of our cabinet-sized stereo. I slithered to where hidden speakers buzz beneath. Holster me, bolster me, tingle of your baritone. Coxswain, oarsman, deep and firm and strong. If ever I should leave you, even down the hall, I tent hardwired eardrum to hardwired taint. <laughs> if I place this disc just so, we'll move together again. Morocco me, embargo me, beverage 
and gargle me, roll me up and cabbage me, stallion as I lather you. Have me on a platter, please, if you fancy food. Just thrust all through a low note. I wait and marinade. You sound the sure vibrato. You growl the deep down way. Your dying father made you vow to use the gift Dieu gave. Merci, Pear, for handing Tigar the key that turns the bolt in me. Wire me, I know, fire me, conduit of dream. I'm a socket hoping to be plugged, a glance waiting to be met, weak need, obvious, a dizzy, cheap, drunk, shish kebab, meat, Balls laid out on a buffet. Ladle me, cradle me. If ever you should leave her, reflect and connect. Me, me, me. Look up my number on any heavenly wall. <laughs> My father says to me, where do you think of these things? <laughs> he didn't ask about that. Um, all right, this is the last one and it's a dream poem. Um, I really do, I don't want to interpret the dream, but I want to tell you, I really do view this as a dream of liberation. It's called Spells Reversal. I bolt upright to sitting, exposed from a dream, where snickering centurions from an absent conquering legion planned to rape me. Wind swirled grit ticked at the linen skirt of the dais where I lay, companioned by my pulse, the only other sound. On my own, I guessed my instructions, removed, even folded, tunic, loincloth, spread myself out on captured belly and balls. As I eyed ants scouting my slick flesh, I prayed subservience might spare me auction and lash. I strained to hear a camel's snort from the direction of the soldier's return. Three vultures wheeled in the east. A bruise spread across the western sky its looming roused me, evoked a fist like no, thrust up by diaphragm, knuckling past dry throat, punching beyond my teeth. Spurred, I rose to my knees, staggered to strap on sandals. Even if it would be slower, it might be safer to shun paving stones and cut across dunes toward grass edged ravines leading to the next oasis. Maybe a Sirocco would erase my path. Maybe cavalry wouldn't bother to track me. But as I scuttled, I grasped, it didn't matter if elders at the closest crossroads balked at hiding their Numidian kin, didn't matter if scorpions stung or vipers bit, if snarling hyenas surrounded me, or if I died of plain thirst. Once I stepped one step from my spot and didn't head back, I was no. I was awake before I awoke. Thank you. We'll pick up chairs. Please hang out. Books are for sale at the counter. Please visit.
And do you want to, can yeah. you say good night to the audience? I thought we were going to do a Q&A first. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you want to do a Q&A? Yeah. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, don't go Okay, yet. let me check the online uh, crew and see if you got any questions there. Does it matter? Yeah. Okay, you're not done with this yet. <laughs> <laughs> I get rid of this anyway. So before we get going, I just want to acknowledge Lori said, Jimmy, you have the best titles. Thank you. Powerful <laughs> work, Stephen. Bravo. So thank you, Lori, who's on screen. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question for you. Yes, please. It just happens to be written in one of your books that I got from the library. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that I'm impressed by in your, your body of work is its variety and the many different forms that you write in. And I'm wondering if you, if, if having all of those different uh, rhetorical uh, uh, possibilities in your toolbox makes a difference when you're starting to write something new, when you have an idea and you approach it, having had so many experience with so many different forms, does that inform how you approach new work? Yeah, definitely. I, I would, can everyone hear me in the back? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of my stuff, especially lately, starts with sort of playfulness or like a joke or a strange premise. And having lots of different genres that I that I can try out gives me a chance to see, you know, where is this going to go? And I don't generally plan that. Some, I just start writing something, and sometimes it turns into a prose poem. Sometimes it turns into line breaks, and you know, and sometimes I'll find older stuff and re-lineate it, reshape it. Some of the poems in my current book are things that I've written maybe ten years ago that I found in in my file when I was trying to structure the book. And I was like, this could be good if it had lot more stanza breaks, you know? <laughs> so some of it is, is uh, just like, as I get older and do more work, I have more different techniques that I can use to revise stuff with, to bring out the, the original premise in the best way. So it, it sounds to me like you're saying that it, it happens in the revision process. It comes into play more in the revision process yes. than in the initial, like, approach to kind the topic. Both, yeah. Kind of both. Yeah. Usually I don't revise poems that much, but sometimes I'll go back and find something that's old and revise it. I don't revise a lot once I've written it because I'm too close to it, but if it's not working, I'll put it aside and forget about it and then find it five years later and then I'll be like, oh, I know what this means, you know, <laughs> or not. Or like, no, this is terrible. I'm glad you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I made the right decisions. <laughs> so um, I guess my, my question for you is, um, when I was reading, I haven't read the one, the one with Robert Goulet, but I've read Engineer, which I loved. And, uh, just all the different persona that you take on. And I feel like there's this movement in Engineer where you start out with other personas, women or, or men that aren't sort of more like yourself, but more sort of standard masculine men, and trying on these other identities. And as it goes on, it feels to me that you reach a point where you're more comfortable being yourself. And I just wonder if that's how you conceived of the collection and, and like what got you to that process of not always trying on other other people to be who you are I think that I think that those are different streams that have been in, in the river of my writing over the past 40 years mm -hmm. all along mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that I, I've continuously uh, written about and explored uh, women and and my uh, identification with with different women um, uh, that hasn't really changed since I was very young um, I think that uh, the way that the book this book uh, Edgemere is uh, uh, organized is more thematic um, the the first the first poem first set of poems are mostly about women and, and uh, different kinds of persona that I take on then the, sec the second part is a poem about my brother and his illness and his death. Um, then in the third part, the poems are more about um, liminal spaces. Um, and then the fourth part is where I have kind of like the, 
the poems I don't want anyone to read that are about penises and addiction. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the audience or your humble readers? Not at all. Dark ones. I want to say David Groff is on line and says, Great Hi. reading, both of you. So glad to hear your poems tonight. Oh, thank you, David. Love Hi, your David. work. Another, uh, I have another question yeah. for you. Yeah. So when I was reading your poems, and admittedly, this, this book is from years ago, but I was really struck by the kind of restless, unpredictable energy, like questioning. And I and I and I I say that as a compliment, not not. Um, I like that about mm -hmm. the poems. And then there will be these twists and turns, like at the end of um, one of your poems. It turns out that the pebble actually is much more dangerous than the tank. <laughs> um, there's, uh, you have a poem called Hating the Babies. And then suddenly there's this line and it says, if only we hadn't already given them the future. And I'm like, whoa, no, I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. So I guess, I mean, it's very hard to talk about something like that about maybe about your own work, but I really, sense it in your early poems and in the in what you read today there's there's such energy and uh life and and kind of link questioning of language and meaning that's so energetic i don't know what to say other than i notice it thank but. you uh, i i find that i write in order to figure out who i am and what i'm thinking and that's such a moving target and i I feel like there's this presumption often that we have to stay one thing or that we find this, this state, like once I was this and now I was that. I once was lost and now I'm found. I was, I was a girl, but I was really a man inside. I was always a man inside. And now I've reached the stable state where I'm a man and that's great. Um, and those are, those are narratives that have some function, you know, to try and try and, um, understand ourselves and focus and stop dithering around and deceiving ourselves that we actually want something, but they can also be really confining. And I think my work takes a lot of weird twists and turns because my personality takes a lot of weird twists and turns. <laughs> and I'm really trying as a, as a trans man or guy adjacent uh -huh. person, <laughs> trans person to embrace that, that fluidity um, instead of feeling like, Oh, well, what if I regret this in five years? You know, well, then I'll have an interesting book, you know? <laughs> then I'll write another book about it. <laughs> so I wonder from, from you, since you seem so uh, identified with an appreciative of femininity, which is a struggle, you know, in a world that sort of beats that out of men, it's, it's a very courageous thing, I think. Um, and I think that is a beautiful thing to be open in that way. Um, have you? Do you have you always identified as an effeminate man, or have you ever thought about what am I? You know, am I something else? So, because we both have that other side to us, but I've decided to actually transition it here and yeah. really a man. I, I gave a reading with um, someone who's non-binary um, in Lowell at a state university in Lowell for the the GPLTQ group, right? And they all went around the room and said what their pronouns were in addition to their names and what their majors were, okay, their academic majors. And when they got back to us, I said, I'm he, him, but if anyone had asked me that question when I was your age, I don't know what my answer would be. I mean, we didn't have, there was, the spectrum was, you know. Uh, <laughs> but also I was very struck by the fact that they were all science and math majors. And in my generation, 
you couldn't be out and be in those disciplines. You wouldn't have been fired. They were really, you know, it, I could become a priest. Um, and, then, and then there were pink collar professions that gay men could go into that where, you know, that we, we could survive in like a buyer for being a hairdresser or whatever, or a librarian, which is what I became. Um, I don't know. I know that I was so afraid of that whole part of me of, of getting beaten up uh, uh, that most of my my acting out happens in the imagination. It doesn't it doesn't happen in in in, in safe spaces like this. But out in the other world, I'm much more. I've learned how to be more uh, straight. I mean, I'm I'm completely out, but I my my behavior is mm -hmm. is rather constrained because of my fears. Yeah, yeah. that's really a shame. Glad we have places like Bureau and our community to let our flag fly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful day. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Please enjoy the space, buy books, and party. <laughs> thank you. Good night, audience.